Welcome to the Ryan Research Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Ryan. I'm joined today by Julius Crane. He is the editor of the American Affairs Journal. He has contributed to numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Times Literary Supplement. He also has a background in private sector finance. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Great. So to start us off, why don't you describe what was the main reason that you thought you had to move from the private sector into more of this public intellectual realm? Um, I'm afraid there wasn't a lot of reason behind it, really. It, it all kind of happened very much by accident. Um, I've told the story a number of times, so I'll, I'll be brief. But uh, basically, um, I was working in finance in 2015, early 2016. Uh, this this guy, Donald Trump, came around. He was really different. Um, and actually, actually, people forget sort of how weird 2016 was. Like, there were just so many different political conversations happening among people that, you know, were normally checked out of politics or whatever. And a lot of ideological lines were being scrambled. But anyway, uh, myself and a few friends, mostly from finance, uh, we, we had sort of been watching the Trump phenomenon and we were sort of, you know, this was very early days, so everyone thought he would fizzle out, but we, we kind of thought there was something there. So we wrote a couple of pieces for, at the time, conventional sort of right of center publications. Um, and then as time went on, basically nobody on the right wanted to publish anything that was, was even sort of remotely Trump friendly or Trump curious, shall we say. Um, and so no one would publish any of our, our sort of commentary anymore. Uh, so, you know, these friends and I started a silly little anonymous blog called the Journal of American Greatness. Um, it was just a Google.com blogspot blog. There was no Substack or anything back then. Uh, it ended up becoming sort of wildly popular, so popular we thought we'd all lose our jobs. We, we shut it down after the uh, nominating convention. Um, but you know, its success was was really interesting and it sort of motivated uh, myself and a few others to try and start something more serious, more formal, right under our own names. And that's kind of how American Affairs was was born in, in 2016 and then we launched in 2017. Great. And if you could encapsulate, what are the main ideas that you're trying to drive home in sort of the American consensus right now? Yeah, well, um, from the beginning, I and, and most others were primarily focused on kind of a couple core issues. One was the phenomenally sort of out of balance economy that had arisen, um, well, for several decades, but particularly after 2000 and, and China WTO accession, and the belief that sort of the US would simply be a kind of software Silicon Valley and, and finance uh, economy, and this was going to work, and that the complete erosion of manufacturing and other hard tech industries was not a problem, um, and that this, the whole sort of neoliberal free trade model um, was working just fine. Uh, we had strong views against that for various reasons, and it's been interesting to watch actually as um, things like industrial policy, things like competition with China, um, a not total, but pretty serious rethinking of the overall free trade consensus. All that has occurred in the United States um, in the last few years since Trump, particularly since COVID and Russia, Ukraine. Um, you know, things like industrial policy are now pretty mainstream agenda items and perhaps the only areas where you actually see the possibilities for bipartisan cooperation um, in policy. Uh, so that's been very interesting to sort of be uh, ahead of that and part of that. Uh, the other thing I think we've always been extremely interested in uh, more uh, theoretically is kind of just the the seeming exhaustion of what I would what I would call kind of conventional liberalism. Um, which has occurred in various ways on both the left and the right. Everybody loves to talk about the new right and so on. Uh, but you also saw just kind of the total abdication of uh, nonpartisanship and liberal neutrality um, in, in recent years behind various sort of woke causes um, or whatever. 
And there's this sense that the kind of old liberal nostrums no longer really account for our politics, no longer adequately describe the world we live in in general, or competition with uh, non-liberal states like China in particular, the, the whole kind of liberal theory of history or the end of history, that's all gone. Um, and we've, we've been very interested in, in kind of exploring that and, and trying to think about the implications of that. Um, so on the one hand, a, a kind of um, strong reassessment of kind of economic neoliberalism and uh, an exploration of, of, of kind of what, what sort of the world looks like in, in kind of dealing with these late liberal uh, sort of disruptions. One of the most fascinating things, I think, from your perspective and, and the adjacent um, content that you've promoted uh, is tackling that liberal perspective. But you're not so much coming at it from a critique saying this is how things were done and this is how we have to do them right now as a as a new thing. But uh, there's this element of the actual historic uh, legacy of, you know, the American state, the American system um, is actually based in some of these non-liberal economic schools of thought. And the liberal paradigm that we're used to is actually more of a recent invention. So can you elaborate further on um, that conversation going back and forth uh, between sort of the newer liberalism and a return to the historic American economic school of thought. Yeah, so, you know, frankly, you probably know more about the historic economic school of thought than I do, given your uh, your book project. But certainly um, early America, 19th century America, um, early 20th century America was a model of, of very high tariffs, um, pretty strong infant industry promotion, at least in certain sectors. Uh, the entire history of, you know, U.S. government funding of railroads and everything that went on there is is absolutely fascinating story of government intervention, corruption, all kinds of financial craziness. Um, and, you know, it, even, even when we get into the kind of liberalizing of the United States, um, it, the story isn't the one that's typically provided. I mean, the tariff reductions, for instance, happened arguably at the, the high point of, of New Deal era economic thought. Um, it wasn't a classical liberal thing. It was the Roosevelt administration that begins rapidly reducing tariffs and uh, entering into a lot of free trade agreements. Of course, at the time, the U.S. is the only industrial power still standing after uh, World War II. So a lot of these ideological notions that we have, you know, fit uh, very differently into the historical context of the time and the very contingent. Um, and then, you know, even um, even going forward more recently to to the kind of neoliberal turn, a lot of the things I've been thinking about recently, you know, that that wasn't exactly the myth um, that we perceive it as, where it was all just sort of tax cuts and deregulation. Um, that stuff happened, of course, uh, but a lot, a lot more was going on. I mean, really, you know, by the time of the 1970s, the U.S. economy is is basically, you know, it's it's facing increasing competitive challenges, all kinds of problems uh, with with the Bretton Woods currency regime. Um, by that time, the U.S. had been allowing countries like Germany and Japan very very favorable and asymmetric sort of trade policies um, as part of the Cold War and rebuilding Europe and other things. Um, so at this time, the U.S. economy is very uncompetitive. We have stagflation, et cetera. And, and early neoliberalism was really a, a sort of means to address that. And what it was, it was not simply about letting the market rip um, the more you study it. It was, it was really about building a new kind of American economy one that would not be relying on the big integrated manufacturers of the 19th and early 20th centuries, but instead would shift toward intellectual property rents and financial rents. Um, so they made a lot of changes. You know, there, there were changes to trade policy to strengthen intellectual property protections. Most trade agreements, incidentally, are really, you know, th those are the things that get negotiated now, at least in U.S. trade agreements. There's not that much to do on tariffs anymore. It's all about like what Amazon gets to do with, uh, you know, Internet sales and stuff like that. Um, there were changes to patent uh, and antitrust regimes. 
so that a company like Apple today, they don't have to manufacture their product, but they can control, uh, you know, the sales, the distribution, the pricing, everything. You know, in the 1960s, if Apple wanted to control that on the iPhone, they would have had to make the iPhone. Um, but in today's trade and patent and antitrust environment, you can out off, uh, outsource all of that manufacturing and just sort of collect the very high margin, high value intellectual property rents on the top. Um, so anyway, I, you know, that's a lot of, you know, neoliberalism was in its own way, a sort of industrial policy. Uh, and it, it has been because of its own self-conception and, and, and others, uh, it's been interpreted as this kind of timeless, permanent, eternal form of economic theory that's sort of always true and is just kind of the natural way to do things. Um, but even that is not, was not so simply a question of, of market liberalization or whatever, as it relied on actually a, a much stricter intellectual property and, and uh, patent regimes and um, very conscious changes to antitrust and things like that. And on this shift away from... Um the more Fordist models of manufacturing and uh, and things that um, are downstream from services. Uh, as we get into more of this like copyright protection and IP and, and financialization of the American economy, what does that do to the overall economic structure of America? And how does that benefit certain interest groups in America? I think the best articulation of this is actually from a uh, UVA professor named Herman Mark Schwartz, um, who, who simply kind of catalogs the differences. Uh, and the big one uh, to him and to myself as well, in my opinion, is if you, you know, in the classic Fordist economy in the 1950s or whatever, the most profitable companies were also the largest employers and the largest investors. So these, of course, are big into integrated manufacturers like GM and GE and, and so on. Um, and through all the changes I described a moment ago, you know, today we have a situation where the most profitable companies, namely the big tech stocks, maybe with a few uh, financial firms thrown in there, um, actually uh, have very small direct employee bases uh, and, and very you know, relative to their size, pretty low CapEx capital expenditure requirements, pretty low internal reinvestment needs. And of course, that's all by design, um, because the more you can off outsource those costs, sequester those costs away from the intellectual property rent, the higher your stock market value, um, you know, the, the stronger shareholder, you know, the better that is for shareholders um, in the current system. Uh, but it, it has real impacts on the overall macro economy. Um, obviously, when most of your workers are cut off from the highest margin companies, they have they have much less bargaining power. I mean, even leaving aside issues around unionization and the policy there, like you can um, you could organize all the Lyft drivers and the Uber drivers, but Uber still loses money. Um, so there's very little you can do. You can organize all the McDonald's workers, um, but the McDonald's franchises are not particularly high margin business. All the money is captured by the trademark holder and the, the overall franchisor uh, and so on. Similarly, with, you know, pretty much across the U.S. Uh, industry, hotels, for example, you know, Hilton owns the brand and various intellectual property about operating hotels. The buildings are owned by private equity firms and other investors. The operations are subcontracted out to third party operators, most of whom have very low margins uh, anyway. Um, so obviously that's had a huge uh, impact on just the distribution throughout the overall workforce. Um, and when you talk about inequality, in addition to all the direct problems with inequality, you know, you have uh, these demand issues where you know, the, the money is captured by people that don't spend and so on, which further kind of depresses growth, depresses investment. Uh, and I think that's been uh, a big part of the story of the, frankly, lackluster performance of most developed world economies, uh, including the United States, particularly since 2000, um, but even going back a bit further than that. Uh, and it also contributes to the financial instability as you have 
essentially instead of a financial sector that's organized to move capital into really capital intensive companies that need to invest more, um, your big companies don't need to invest more. You have all these, you know, financial cash flow streams. Uh, you have nowhere to go except to sort of recycle them into speculative plays in the financial system. That leads to things like the financial crash and so on. It's people are looking for new assets, new ways to deploy capital in unconventional ways. Uh, and then, of course, um, the most directly important and politically in the U.S., perhaps the easiest one to talk about, is you've had a massive erosion of the defense industrial base. And all of this loss of manufacturing and industry has now contributed to major national security issues. Um, we, we can barely... Well, we can't really produce enough artillery shells um, for the war in Ukraine, even though we're not even involved in the war directly. Um, we we did a we did a deal with Australia on submarines. We can't build those submarines. We don't have the capacity to do it. It's been delayed and delayed. We can barely make a make a you know an airplane that could fly. Um, all kinds of issues throughout the the defense industrial base and other critical and strategic sectors. Uh, generic pharma, another one, um, you know, 90% of U.S. generic pharma is produced in China and India, all kinds of safety issues there. Um, obviously, we had a disruption in supply, whether due to a pandemic, whether due to, you know, a military issue, we couldn't do surgeries in this country. Um, so that there are those issues as well that are, are becoming increasingly uh, impossible to ignore. And even, even outside the macroeconomic issues, um, have have really changed uh, a lot of the debate here, I think. And so what is it about this trend where we see all these weaknesses starting to emerge and there is this interest group that is gaining from that, which uh, you tend to call the managerial class or various other uh, similar words. Um, how did the managerial class uh, gain its ascendancy? Why did it gain its ascendancy? And why is it so hard to unshake its grip on the American political economy? Well, um, not to be uh, ungenerous to your, your question there, but actually, you know, I have written, I think it's a piece called The Real Class War um, about sort of the decline of kind of the uh, the lower upper sections of the elite um, so even, you know, within the top 10%, you know, the bottom seven, eight, nine percent is actually not doing that well. Um, they, they haven't necessarily, their incomes haven't been going down or whatever, but the costs of maintaining their status have been rising very rapidly, education, housing, um, et cetera. Uh, so I've actually argued that the, we have a very managerial society. But actually, the managerial class itself um, has, has kind of has kind of eaten itself uh, in the construction of this paradigm, uh, and it's getting increasingly narrower and narrower. Um, and even if you actually look at finance, um, finance sort of recapitulates the, uh, the the trends in the economy as a whole, where you have kind of upward redistribution of wealth in the midst of sort of decelerating. Uh, or stagnant overall growth, uh, and and there you know it's not like it was in the 1980s where you could just go start your own private equity firm and you're you're going to make a lot of money or whatever. Um, so I, I actually think we you know a lot of the disruptions and turmoil and political turmoil we've seen in recent years is actually driven by the increasingly straitened conditions of the managerial class itself. Uh, the decline in the working class really took place between 1970 and, you know, the early 2000s. And frankly, politics didn't care at all. Uh, I think if, if we're being honest, uh, you know, that we have a hard time admitting that given, you know, the self-perception of America as a democracy and whatnot. But truthfully, you, you disenfranchised the entire working class and, and there wasn't really a problem. Um it politically, I mean, we were in the, the happy 90s. Everybody thought it was great. It was the end of history. Nobody was complaining that po U.S. politics was played within the 50 yard line or whatever. Um, it, it's really since 2000 when you start to see a lot of the deterioration in this kind of upper middle managerial class where we get increasing bouts of populism. 
Occupy Wall Street, uh, and then of course leading up to the the Trump uh, 2016 and Sanders as well. And what's interesting about all these cases is that the political radicalism tends not to be driven by, in America at least, it's not the working class. No one is out organizing, you know, the IWW in working class exurbs in America. The radical left groups or whatever, you know, these are upper middle class, elite colleges, Silicon Valley, um, places like that are the dominant places of elite radicalism. You also see in a lot of, you know, you have kind of downwardly mobile or underemployed elites who have PhDs or whatever, um, but are working at Starbucks. And then they go out and unionize at Starbucks. That's not a commentary on whether unionizing Starbucks is a good idea or not. It's just saying that ra political radicalism in the U.S. is kind of driven by these downwardly mobile or stagnant elites. And I think it's intensified as pressure on the actual managerial class has grown um, in more recent decades. And I think that speaks to the fact that, you know, it is a very managerial society insofar as you can actually disenfranchise and, you know, not to be too dramatic about it, but sort of immiserate the working class or, you know, essentially reduce their real standard of living without having a major political disruption. But when it starts to hit the managerial class, all of a sudden we have these political disruptions. So we have a managerial society on the one hand, but it's actually a smaller and smaller group of uh, of the managers, if you will, who are really benefiting it. I think that's driving a lot of our politics. So yeah, so there's this critical inflection point that occurs in the 2000s where um, uh, the, the successes of uh, the roaring 80s of boomers, you know, kind of uh, embracing that managerial class and winning from it, that starts to be cannibalized of itself. So from the 2000s on, we understand why the working class has suffered. But can you elaborate more on why is the managerial class, as you say, that bottom seven to eight percent, why is that getting squeezed? And, um, you know, what is the upper, you know, one to two percent? Uh, you know, what are they doing in their interest that is fighting against the 78%? Yeah. Um, well, it's basically, as, as you've created this economy that relies and revolves more and more around rent-seeking activity, um, you need fewer and fewer managers. When you're actually trying to coordinate large uh, physical supply chains, um, coordinating large groups of labor and capital, you need managers. Um, when, when you basically sort of already have an established intellectual property rent, um, you don't actually need them. They, you know, then it just becomes a game to see who can, who can sort of get, get their head into the trough and participate in them. But you actually need you need fewer and fewer uh, people with real managerial or even more broadly, I would say, scientific skill um, to use the finance industry example, which I'm most familiar with personally. Um, you know, the big trend of the last couple of decades has been the rise of passive investing, which means instead of going out and I'm going to find the best company uh, or whatever and invest in that, and it's going to outperform its rivals, and I'm going to make more money. The trend is basically, I'm just going to buy an index fund and track the S&P 500. Um, so you need a couple people to, to set up the index fund, um, but you don't need that many. They, you, can't, you don't really have to pay them that well because it just kind of runs on autopilot. Um, you can't claim like, oh, this guy's like finding new deals every day, and without, without this manager, I could never be successful. Um, just like, well, as long as the thing tracks the S&P, that's all I need, all I need it for. Um, similarly, when, when you have, you know, the routinization of these kind of conventional private equity playbooks and so on, every, everything just sort of becomes commoditized. So the active managers uh, decline um, and active managers, you know, you, you can charge less for passive uh, managers than you can for active managers. Uh, and so, as I said, you actually like there were a lot more people. Like, I don't know, you know, if you watch the movie Wall Street or something from the 1980s, you had all these sort of stockbrokers who were making a good living. Um, stockbroker is not a particularly prestigious 
uh, occupation occupation anymore to the extent it even exists. Like you just don't need these people. Um, because at the time they were seen as like going out there and finding investments and ways to deploy capital. And you just don't need that anymore. Uh, similarly, I think, you know, in Silicon Valley in the early days when it was mainly defense funded, you had a lot of sort of really new technology being developed and, and it tended to be more capital intensive physical technology. Um, now when it's sort of like, well, we'll just sort of make another dating app or another software product that's basically the same or maybe a slight incremental improvement to another one. Again, it's, it's, it's much more commoditized. You don't necessarily need like uh, real scientists or whatever. Um, and it, it kind of becomes a marketing game and they, uh, you know, the real power is just how much capital you have. Can you go out and buy a monopoly? If, if you raise enough VC funding, you can go buy a monopoly. That That's the game. It's not so much as product driven or business driven in a way that requires real managerial talent or skill anymore. And so, as I argued in, in the, the real class war piece, they're actually, you know, back in the 80s, you know, breaking up these kind of big stagnant corporations was a really thrilling prospect for aspiring managers. And there was a lot of money to be made there. But today, actually, like, uh, you know, there's probably more opportunity in, say, designing an industrial policy or dealing with a lot of the public sector problems uh, that the country faces as opposed to doing another copycat Silicon Valley tech company or whatever. So again, I think some of these trends have have pushed uh, U.S. managerialism toward at least reconsidering some more state state driven uh, endeavors rather than the sort of 1980s style neoliberal endeavors. So that moves us into 2016 and post 2016. So what was what was it about the Trump turn that signaled that people were thinking differently? How did Trump do? And then how did Biden and the Democrats pick up from there, which uh, I think the consensus is, again, Biden has largely uh, embraced at least the theme of Trump protectionism and sort of an adversarial relationship towards China. Um, you've written about his chip sack before. Um, so yeah, can you speak to the Trump turn and then how the Democrats have picked that, picked that up? Yeah, well, I think the big thing about Trump is sort of, why was Trump the one to do this? Um, because I, I don't, you know, I don't want to get into the whole pro-Trump, anti-Trump, let's talk about Trump's personality or his crazy statements kind of thing. That's boring. But like, there's no question that Trump is, shall we say, an idiosyncratic figure um, who, as president, displayed comparatively little interest in substance policy. Uh, and and I think it's a re it's very revealing that it basically took somebody like that who basically, you know, in addition to his own idiosyncratic, charismatic personality, didn't really owe anybody in the larger political apparatus anything. And so I think, you know, the Trump themes had been laying out there for a while, um, certainly since 2008, uh, maybe even a little bit before that. Um, and no one, particularly in the Republican Party, was really willing to touch them um, because there was there was no donor interest in it. There was no sort of establishment think tank uh, or, or media interest in it, even though, um, you know, it should have been clear, I think, that there was widespread discontent with the kind of conventional policy paradigms, particularly on the right. Um, and, and Trump, to his credit, uh, saw that and, you know, for better and for worse, he just didn't care about uh, various niceties and processes that everybody else did, uh, and he won. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I, you know, part of this, I think you can blame on Trump because he showed very little discipline or actual desire to implement an agenda while in office. In general, he, he liked to be on TV, he liked to tweet. He liked to sort of talk to other billionaires now that he was president and they had to sort of be nice to him. Um, but he, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't, you know, it, 
in a good way, when he wasn't an ideological figure, otherwise he would have been a conventional politician like everyone else. But in a bad way, he didn't really have any interest in really putting together a movement, realigning American politics. And I think he missed a lot of opportunities as a result. Um, now, you know, what's interesting about Biden and the Democrats, uh, well, I, I should say, actually, the other part of it, though, isn't all Trump's fault. Like there was there were no real cadres, no apparatus, no group of people that really shared this agenda. I mean, one of the reasons our stupid little blog got so much attention is because no one else was willing to write any of this stuff. There had been no one particularly on the right of center thinking about these things, no one who was ready to like, you know, be appointed uh, to X department or X agency and really implement an agenda. Um, even if you could find a handful of people, and there were a couple like Robert Lighthizer, there was no real staff. You know, a president appoints, I don't know, I think it's like 4,000 and maybe as much as 10,000 people, as many as 10,000 people. Um, and there just weren't uh, groups for that. There were plenty of neoliberal Republican organizations, but there was nothing else. So Trump had nobody to really appoint and run with uh, when he was president, even if he wanted to do something serious. Now, moving to the Democrats, um, it's been very interesting to watch. And part of what I think, you know, the simplest explanation is they got really scared. Um, Trump won. That was, you know, a huge threat. To, they saw that as a genuine existential threat. Um, you know, the fascism stuff is overheated, but to some extent they believed it. And they sort of felt they had to do anything to defeat Trump. And that if that meant sort of taking over some of his issues, so be it. Now, I, I think that explains some things. I don't think that tells the whole story um, because you certainly have seen a substantive shift uh, in the Biden administration. Not that I think it's perfect or that they've done everything right, but there's no question that, you know, competition with China is now a bipartisan thing and the Biden administration has been surprisingly tough on a number of export controls and other things. Um, they they did the CHIPS Act. Um, they are very serious about a number of other industrial policy measures. Um, and I, I think part of that is that, again, within the managerial class, even though it wasn't expressed, like serious people had been thinking about these things. Uh, and when the opportunity arose, um, they sort of, uh, you know, adopting them wasn't that hard. And again, because the Democratic Party is is the governing party in America, it's the only party capable of putting forward a positive agenda, for better or for worse. Um, that that's where the you know they have a much easier time doing things than Republicans. Uh, so when they need something done, they have the technocrats to do it. Um, and it's just you know the the way that like Democratic foundations work. The right foundations, at least the big one, they be, the big ones, they basically they've been around since the 70s or 80s. Um, they have their little group of people that they hire. They're the same people that have been there for generations. They're not going to change their views on anything. Um, and they have on the um, for the most part on the left, like on the foundation world and stuff, it's a little bit more dynamic. So you get you get new people in there and they tend to replace more of the staff and all of a sudden you go in different directions. Um, so for them, embracing industrial policy ha happened actually fairly quickly. Um, the other part of it, if you, you know, talk to some people, they'll say, you know, Biden is fundamentally a, a kind of Clinton guy in terms of how he approaches politics. Which doesn't necessarily mean I don't. I'm not talking in terms of policy here, but I mean effectively what Clinton did uh, after things started to go south in the early days of the administration is he basically just took over the Republicans' agenda and repurposed it. Um, and so the Democrats, you know, especially people in Biden's circle who are you know older, they they cut their teeth in the '90s or even earlier than that. They remember the '90s. You know, doing this sort of thing is kind of conventional politics for them. They don't they don't have a real problem with it. They're not as ideological and, and sort of orthodox, you know, rigidly orthodox and devoted to an ideology like the Republicans are. Um, so I think for all those factors, um, you've seen the Democrats embrace this, you know, these agendas. And, uh, you know, I'm biased here, but I also think that uh, there's, there's elements of truth to this, whatever your partisan orientation. And, and you, you know, it just couldn't be ignored any longer. And particularly after COVID and Russia, Ukraine, um, you know, the end of history kind of mindset was just 
Yeah. You, you had to be a real true believer to maintain that. You had to be either, you know, freaking really ideological or a professional economist to still believe that. Um, and if you weren't in one of those categories, like, you know, OK, the world has changed. We need to we need to adapt. We need new policies. Uh, so I think for all those reasons, you've seen some major shifts uh, uh, on the left of center. Yeah. So you so you talk about those shifts and you talk about how the Democrats have more of a uh, dynamism when it comes to their um, intellectual milieu. What do you think of the green movement and how so much of the Democrats industrial policy, which in many ways is an overlay on what that sort of Trumpian protectionism was, um, would they have gone the same path if there was not this emergent green movement with their Green New Deal adherence. Um, you know, you could go down the list of like Mariana Mazzucato and and different people like that. Um, is is that part of the main drivers of pushing Biden and his fellow travelers down this industrial strategy path? Or is it that, you know, we're in a multipolar world now and they have to wake up and, you know, smell what's going on? Yeah, uh, it's really interesting. I, I think there's multiple things going on on here. Um, so the green movement stuff, you know, that, that's been around for a long time. Um, and, it, you know, actually, it, it began as a fairly conservative, you know, it was conservationism. It had certain right wing associations. Um, it actually was, you know, very tied into a lot of eugenics and and sort of racial stuff the early environmental movement you know if you go go read some of that stuff from the early days 20s 30s 40s 50s even up until the 60s there was some real you know it's kind of a northern european thing to care about uh the you know the wilderness and blah 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 so it's, you know and then um eugenics and all that becomes unpopular for obvious reasons then it shifted into sort of population control and that was like Paul Ehrlich and the population bomb stuff. Uh, and then, you know, for obvious reasons, too, that that gets unpopular. And then more recently, it's about sort of climate and, and, and carbon and stuff like that. Um, in the neoliberal era, of course, the, the you know, it's, it's fascinating. There, I don't know if you know him. There's this guy, Emmett Penny. Uh, he's written, I think, three articles for us, and I'm just cribbing that. He's um, he's been on the podcast too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, the, he writes these great histories, but you know, in the neoliberal era, the Greens were were very neoliberal. Um, so you know, they were teaming up with Enron and the natural gas industry to go after other fossil fuels, um, carbon trading, carbon credits. That was you know, very market based kind of thing. That was their approach. Very kind of globalist um kyoto protocols all these kinds of where you know we got we got a pool sovereignty and all that um and now of course uh yeah it's it's heavy into industrial policy and so on so to some extent i think you know the green movement just adapts a little bit to whatever whatever the larger macro political and macroeconomic environment is to some extent it also has pushed it though um because you know the greens themselves at least in their self-understanding you know they would say well we, we tried all the neoliberal stuff and that didn't work so now you know we got to really use the state to um to advance you know green energy and so on and you know we, we'd love to do it at the global level but that's just not going to happen so we got to do it at the national level and that's it uh, and, you know, that's a real thing. Uh, I, I don't want to discount that. Um, though to me, to me, a lot of it, you know, it, we've had, you know, it wasn't in, in neoliberalism, we had the end of history and all that was very globalist. In the Cold War, also in the United States, like you, you didn't have an overt sort of nationalism as we did in, say, you know, World War II or even before that. Like it was very much a sort of, U.S. is leader of the free world. It, it, it had its own kind of the allies and all this sort of global stuff. So my point is we've had, I don't know, four, four plus generations or so of globalist mentality and, and sort of U.S. political morality. It sort of has to be globally inflected. Like there's 
And, and this is one of the things that, you know, we've sort of tried to kind of understand a little bit better at American Affairs. But I mean, the very few Democratic or liberal or centrist, even many people on the right in the U.S. of of the kind of upper upper class professional elite would feel comfortable just sort of stating that, like, we, we have to do what's best for Americans. Um, a few are OK with that, it's just kind of admitting that the U.S. is a normal country and we have to sort of deal with that and uh, operate accordingly. Um, but most of them, you know, they think in these kind of post-imperial terms uh, and they, you know, to simply say that, you know, even to say we're competing with China, that has to be kind of put into a context of like some kind of larger moralistic struggle. Um, it can't just be kind of a normal nationalistic thing. Uh, and the the green stuff, the climate stuff, like it fits well with that. It's something that it rationalizes strong state activity um, in a way that maintains kind of a global patina and doesn't seem too self-interested. It's sort of one of the only causes that they can really embrace wholeheartedly. Sort of a, yes, we're we're saving the planet uh, and so on. Um, you know. I could complain about it, but I think that's just sort of how it works, in my opinion. And uh, it's been interesting to see, too, how much it's sort of shift. You know, it, it's kind of the excuse that can justify anything at this point. Um, so even things like permitting reform, which traditionally was seen as like that was sort of a right wing or libertarian cause against the environmental left. The environmental left is, you know, putting all these restrictions, preventing building and stuff. Uh, now, industrial expansion, among other things. Now it's sort of, well, the environmentalists, like, we need to do permitting reform so we can build battery factories and solar farms and wind farms, etc. cetera. Uh, so that it's just, it's really interesting how sort of green moralism is needed to justify pretty much anything um, and has become the kind of acceptable moral cause uh when kind of what you might call more conventional notions of liberal moralities have kind of faded or just cannot really be claimed as as overtly anymore um so you're kind of left with that and um i'm not saying it's all crazy or whatever but it, it's sort of you know it's the conventional it's the thing that can be used to sort of justify anything yeah and the the double-edged sword of the of the green agenda is obviously it is this moralistic uh globally contextualized uh, motivation to justify a national industrial strategy um but at the same time the other side of the double edged sword is the fact that china is like a black hole of gravity when it comes to green tech and supply chains and so by furthering um green investment uh, even if you do it on a national scale, um, and what you point out in your TRIPS article, um, there is still a huge amount of the supply chain, the inputs, the natural resources, um, you know, in terms of that supply chain, where are you getting the inputs, but also like what stage are you actually making chips or other sorts of technology? Then where do you sell them to? Does it end up actually like helping China ultimately in the end? So could you talk about a little bit more of how um, China has this monopoly on a large extent of what we consider green tech. And really, if there's more and more pursuit of that without total kind of autarkic thinking, uh, it will just go to strengthen China anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, if the U.S. converted to electric cars overnight, um, China would control all the supply chains. Um, they control a lot of the manufacturing uh, it would be a, it'd be a huge sort of uh, supply chain dominance win for China. Um, and, and that's true in a number of solar solar panels as well. I would say at this point, that's kind of an internal fight among the environmentalist crowd. So you have maybe some of the some of the most hardcore climate people allied with the professional economists who say like, it doesn't matter who makes the stuff. We just have to, we just have to decarbonize now. And if that means we're totally subservient to China, so be it. Um, but then the, the kind of uh, 
I don't know what you would call them, but the, the industrial policy oriented uh, green crowd, um, you know, says, no, we have to build up our own, our own capacities, our own supply chains in these industries. That's why we're doing all this stuff. I would say, you know, that's a, that's very much a kind of internal thing within within the Democratic Party at this point. I would say at this current moment within the Biden administration, the industrial policy people have won. Um, may not last forever. I wouldn't have said that, you know, a few years ago. But at this point, I think, you know, the the preponderance of forces are on the side of building America's own capacity in these sectors and building its own battery uh, plants and things like that. I don't know if like that will be enough because China has a huge lead and so on. And uh, I'm not sure that the measures taken to date will will really, you know, counteract that. I mean, if you just look at the statistics on uh, battery gigafactories, it's something like 10 to one advantage in China versus the US, even after all of the, the new funding here. Um, but in terms of the actual policy discussion, I think there are there aren't too many people saying that, you know, even on the kind of left green crowd that, well, we should just become subservient to China. Who cares? Um, I think part of that is, you know, after Russia, Ukraine, it kind of became very clear that the world was fracturing into blocks, whether you like it or not. Um, part of that is, you know, it's fairly easy to point out that China's climate rhetoric isn't all that sincere and they're building a lot of coal plants and stuff like that. Um, so it's a tough case to argue for the kind of extreme uh, economist crowd, I'll call them. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, that can change at any moment. Um, and there's there's no question that there's a huge tension there. I think, the you know, the bigger problem is probably that the right in America is so confused that it can't really offer its own sort of coherent, positive agenda that would that could you know, wouldn't have as much moral baggage around this stuff. Instead, it's it's still kind of divided between neo-Reaganism and, and something different. Um, the other one on the left is like you you still have some of these diehards from the Sierra Club or whatever who who basically, you know, sue everybody who tries to build something for, you know, environmental issues. Um, and then you have kind of the the new supply side progressive crowd that wants to rein that in. Um, so again, as with a lot of these things, because the Democrats are kind of the only party with a positive agenda, a lot of these debates tend to be kind of intra left wing squabbles. Um, but there we are. Yeah, zooming out a little bit. Um to the motivations around, you know, what to do about China. Um, is China inevitable? Um, there is this perspective, I'll, I'll call it like the Ray Dalio perspective that takes this very like civilizational uh, perspective that, you know, China's huge, it's so long lasting, they're on the rise. It's not a matter of uh, competition, really. This is just the way history turns. Uh, and so you got guys like Ray Dalio that are basically saying like, America's over, maybe the West in general is over. You know, we should just, you know, pack up and and uh, ride the coattails of China on their growth. So what do you do about this perspective in America uh, from a lot of its elites that whether they whatever opinion they might have on industrial strategy or what America should do, there's just this uh, trajectory that they don't see there's any way out of of China's going to dominate. And so you can either lose uh, when they dominate or you can win with them when they dominate. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the problem with, I think, U.S. policy discussions on this topic is that Americans tend to spend more time thinking about China than they do about themselves. Um, so whatever the trajectory of China happens to be, that that doesn't mean that we can't actually take care of our own economy and do things that would be good for Americans, uh, in my view. Uh, and that would include um rebalancing some of these economic issues which you know frankly would be good for china too and and actually a number of chinese thinkers recognize that they they obviously have have a view on who they want to come out on top but they're not actually you know they understand why the u.s would want to rebuild some manufacturing capacity and they think it's kind of crazy that we don't or that we haven't um i 
that's how I, I tend to think, you know, our pro we need we need to focus on our own problem, which is not to say that we should, you know, be aware of uh, obvious national security risks or direct national security risks and respond to them. But when it comes to sort of economic policy, I think, you know, we need to rebuild the United States regardless. And a in the in the long term, like you can't you can't win with China if you're just importing their stuff and sort of recycling financial flows. Um, it, it, you know, for all the reasons that Michael Pettis and others have argued that that is not a sustainable long-term solution. And if, if you do in fact go that route, you're actually going to lose the financial dominance that people like Ray Dalio so rely on. And, um, you know, it's very useful for his short-term interests, but long-term it's, you know, it'll be a complete disaster. And even from the Chinese perspective, you know, they have, they have all these imbalances of their own, um, which I think have been better for them than they have been for us over the last 20 years. But there's no question that, you know, this huge export reliance, this the growth model that they have around sort of exports plus, you know, residential construction and all that, that's showing some real strains as well. And, you know, frankly, they would, you know, the only way that you can win with China is if, if, if both sides rebalance a bit more, the U.S. becomes uh, a bit stronger at manufacturing, China, you know, kind of loosens up and becomes a little bit more consumer focused. That's the only way I see any kind of mutual, you know, successful outcome. There's still going to be foreign policy tensions, but I think both would be in a better position to navigate them if you had, you know, kind of both having stronger, more balanced economies. If you just keep leaning into the current system, um, the U.S. will further erode and become, you know, weaker and weaker, increasing its need for sort of "quote unquote" military solutions. While China will also face a lot of its own internal pressures that may lead it to, you know, foreign adventurism, shall we say, that you know uh, ends badly for everyone. So I don't really, you know, I don't know who's going to have the largest or the richest economy in a hundred years. But regardless, I think you have to rebalance these fundamental economic issues and that has to come through you know industrial policy uh a reform of the current trading system uh, and so on and so i think that that jumps on to uh a point you wrote about where you talked about the need for a uh, coherent political community in the united states which seems like there's not really that and that is a contributor to the problem of um, like Ray Dalio kind of having this short term perspective on where to place his capital and where to place kind of like ultimately his allegiance. Um, so what are your thoughts on how you build a coherent political community that can reshape a an elite towards a nationally positive outcome? Well, if I knew the answer to that, I would be a lot more successful than I am. Uh, so I don't claim to know. I mean, I think I think for people like, you know, using Ray Dalio as kind of the example, and I don't know, like Matthew Walther wrote a review of his book, um, is a hilarious review. You should check it out. It's called Principles for Dummies. Um but, you know, for all his success, like, it's very clear from his book that, like, Ray Dalio is not a particularly deep thinker partic and doesn't know very much about political issues or history. Um, and, I, you know, for people like that, like, they just sort of absorb this kind of overall end of history milieu. And, you know, they just think everybody wants to be Americans like them. And, you know, it's going to be 1999 forever. And if it's not, then, you know, there's some like weird, weird, tired, tyrannical thing or, or some disinformation or something. But they, you know, they can't actually grasp that there might be people with fundamentally different interests with, you know, equally respectable but contradictory values or conflicting value systems. And I, I don't think they just they just don't know how to deal with that. They think everybody wants to be Americans and everybody wants to have the same same overall economic uh, system as as they enjoy. And, you know, it just so happens that the status quo has been really good for them. And so certainly everybody else must think it's really good for them, too. And why can't we all just get along? Um, that's where I think the problem is. 
to me, the the most the the near term, the proximate and most likely driver of the changes um, will come from a corporate lobby, sort of recognizing that, shall we say, nationalism uh, will be more profitable for them than globalism, um, and that you know that's slowly happening. Um, I think the conditions for that happening are there. There's kind of a lot of path dependency, a lot of ideological miasmas out there. Um, but you know, in U.S. politics, if you want to change policy, you need a corporate lobby. Um, the intellectual stuff is fun. I wouldn't say it's totally unimportant. It's entertaining, um, but it 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 may decide what people talk about, but it doesn't actually determine what gets done. The Chips Act happened because the Semiconductor Industry Association and um, some important university lobbies wanted it to happen. Without them, like all of the think tanks and the policy paper, none of that would matter. Um, and what we see so far in the, you know, the emerging industrial policy landscape it are cases where you, know, you have some convergence of the intellectual world with a real powerful corporate lobby that wants to you know, put some resources behind, behind it and get policy change accomplished. Um, and that just hasn't quite been as widespread as it would need to be um, to sort of, you know, fully reshape the incentives. Um, but I think of a few more, you know, much like with neoliberalism uh, 50 years ago, as a few more corporate lobbies see this as their path to, you know, their short term interests uh, and, and you start to change some incentives that creates a larger uh, kind of um, framing where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and all of a sudden everybody wants to do that. Um, so I think the intellectual climate is mostly there. I would say that, you know, the, the politicians are pretty close. It's kind of the major corporate lobbies in the U.S. that are not quite ready to give up on globalism yet. And I don't think they will be until they see that, you know, it's actually in their bottom line interest. Yeah, so how does that cut against um, uh, this critique that, you know, if you could just summarize that up a little bit more, you know, these are multinational corporations, uh, they've actually uh, transcended, uh, you know, national thinking, and that they will inevitably always see their interest as expanding, you know, into the global markets and taking advantage of rising consumer markets across the developing world. So, you know, how do you rewrite that logic that they have and actually show that at the end of the day, sort of national interests always come back to uh, either help or hurt them? Yeah, uh, it's a couple of different things. Um, first, I think we're we're seeing some just kind of general changes in the corporate profit making landscape. Um, if you look at chips, for example, um, the reason the sort of fabulous or, you know, the fabulous model of semiconductor was, was very popular and very profitable um, is because, it, you know, if you're a fabulous semiconductor, maker, you just design the chips, you don't actually make them right. Um, the point of that is that you can outsource all that capital and labor intensive and, and costly manufacturing to, you know, commodity manufacturers. And you have all the power with the IP and, and they, you know, you can push very, you know, good terms for you and they're going to compete, you know, they're going to be, you know, it's a race to the bottom for the manufacturer to, to get business with you. Um, what you've seen is as TSMC became so dominant and Intel so bad um, that when, when TSMC is a monopoly, actually, they have a lot of power. Uh, so now NVIDIA has, you know, TSMC can force NVIDIA or whoever to accept kind of bad terms for them. And so even though like a lot of the U.S. semiconductor firms don't actually make any chips, they wanted the CHIPS Act because they actually want to have some manufacturing competition um, so that, you know, they can reap the benefits of being fabulous as opposed to the costs. Uh, and I think you see a little bit of that across multiple industries. You know, if you look at 
you know, a famous case study is like drones, for instance. Um, we had all kinds of Silicon Valley companies that were going to be, we're going to make the software for drones. And that's, that's where the real money is. But it turns out that like China made all the drones and DJI is, you know, the only one who, who could make a drone. So uh, then they got to decide which software company they used and they didn't pick the Silicon Valley one. Um, so you're starting to see, you know, just the incentives of this overall shift toward the IP economy kind of reaching a terminal point where they don't quite work as advertised anymore. Um, so that's one factor. The other factor, of course, is that um, the, the sort of globalist consumer model with the U.S. as kind of the consumer of last resort. You know, we've been doing that for 30, 40 years. It's kind of running out of steam. And yeah, actually, you know, again, a global semiconductor company doesn't necessarily care about the United States or whatever, but they like the idea of the United States giving them subsidies. They like the idea of Europe giving them subsidies. You know, they, they're going to compete for subsidies everywhere. But, you know, that at this point may be more valuable from like from just consumer market share. Um, and last but not least, I think that, um, you know, and, and I sort I frankly admire them a little bit for this, like China, China is not, China has not lost touch with its national interests. China is still a kind of project state. China still, you know, thinks in terms of kind of Chinese dominance of supply chains uh, and things like that. And no matter how much you sort of wish that away, just never quite happens. And so, yeah, you know, after a lot of years of sort of China giving companies subsidies and they invite them in, but then it turns out that Chinese competitors actually win all the business uh, once they've taken the technology and, you know, they get more subsidies than the foreign ones do. Um, people kind of see this and they sort of recognize that, you know, China's very explicit about wanting to dominate global supply chains. So, no matter how much you want globalism, like the, the world, the world, you know, China doesn't necessarily want it as much as you do. Um, and so I think, you know, the combination of those three factors, you know, companies are increasingly wary of China. Um, they're not they're not totally on board with U.S. industrial policy, but they also kind of recognize that the long term strategy of China is, isn't going to be to make a bunch of U.S. shareholders rich. Uh, they will use that instrumentally, but at the end of the day, China has a clear view of its national interests. It is not shy about pursuing it. It can be very heavy handed in pursuing it. Um, and so I think, you know, there's there's more and more dynamics of, um, or at least like I said, the basic conditions are there for some corporate realignment, even if it hasn't quite happened yet. Great, great. And uh, we've been talking a lot like, at this level up here. So to bring it back to the ground a bit on um, a few other topics, um, you know, how does this affect, uh, you know, the working class again? How does this affect more of like American demographic trends? Uh, you were on the ISI podcast and I saw you make an interesting comment where you talked about in America right now, you may be on welfare and you're having kids or you're not on welfare and you're not having kids. And so jumping from there, uh, what does our economic structure, like how does that translate into that fact? And what are the consequences of that fact? Yeah, well, and that's not only true in America, I believe. I think it's true across the West. Um, but uh, yeah, I, so one, you're actually already seeing it where, you know, in the, in the neoliberal heyday, it was all about superstar cities. Um, and you had a growing concentration of economic power and wealth in you know a few cities, New York and San Francisco and DC and, and maybe a couple others. Um, since COVID in particular, but also I think uh, increasingly with you know if you if you had a lot of manufacturing investment, you already see you know batter, battery factories being built in Georgia and stuff like that. I think you will see more of a more of a, a more distributed uh, levels of investment throughout American regions um, and not everything clustered in Silicon Valley or whatever. Uh, and I, you know, that that's obviously, 
very positive um, for a lot of regions that were left behind in the neoliberal era, but also if you want to bring the demographics into it, um, it's almost impossible uh, unless you're super rich to to have a family in New York, New York City. Um, you know, the, the housing costs are too expensive, the schools are terrible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so moving more activity out to suburban uh, mid-sized cities, other regions, um, is definitely a, a plus on that. Um, I think it's an, it, you know, I have always been, I have always placed less of an emphasis on like bringing back the jobs, so to speak. Um, it's very clear that there are jobs related to it because all of these companies are now saying that we, we have to like ramp up immigration significantly or we'll never fill the jobs. Um, so all the stories about manufacturing not bringing back any jobs, you know, <laughs> does seem seem doesn't seem to fit with that. But um, it, you know, I think it is true that you 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 do have more automated manufacturing. Um, you're you're not going to have as many manufacturing jobs as you had in 1950 or whatever. Um, but with more manufacturing industry actually brought back, you know, uh, there are a number of advantages just to that sector. Um, in terms of productivity, in terms of indirect employment, uh, and so on. So even if you don't actually get that that many jobs, so to speak, um, the rise of uh, productivity, particularly regional productivity, um, is the strongest driver of wage increases, um, and 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 also a lot of you know indirect employment. The the other thing I think, which is you know not really the sort of economics literature doesn't quite know how to grasp this. But again, for me, it's it's not simply about bringing manufacturing or production back for its own sake. It's about sort of uh, healing, if you will, um, to use a very you know woo-woo term, um, this fissured economy that we have. So instead of like a narrow circle of people benefiting from a, you know, intellectual property and financial rents, uh, which is what we've had. If you bring back production, what that means is you are reconnecting more people to those large corporate profits. Um, and again, I think that that will be obviously much better for the vast majority of workers, one. Um, but two, it will also, I think, have a positive effect in generating more demand and more investment in the kind of positive economic cycle. Uh, that you want that can hopefully repair um, some of the damage that has occurred over the last few decades. Uh, so I think if you put all that together, um, that bodes well for uh, you know for the working class and, and you know middle class as a whole. Uh, and and also in terms of you know the family question in particular, I mean it, it's it's kind of a truism, but when you have uh, you know Capital intensive industries like manufacturing tend to privilege stability in their workforce. Um, you have to train train your workers and you also, it's key to keep your plant running at 100% all the time. Whenever it's not, you're losing money. And it, because it's capital intensive, you have fixed costs. You get what I'm saying. So that, you know, in the 1950s, the kind of, uh, you know, story was like every every, you know, corporation wanted to have like married employees with stable families and kids in school because they weren't going to go anywhere and they would be committed to the company for their whole life and you'd have this very stable workforce which i think you know it's not the only factor i'm not an economic determinist or whatever reductionist but that's certainly a helpful dynamic if you want to have strong families as opposed to the kind of neoliberal economy which is all based on low-wage workers in low-margin industries just in time kind of supply chains, being able to lay people off, you know, very flexible and precarious labor, um, you know, whether that's in terms of kind of uh, what are the surprise scheduling or, you know, last minute scheduling. We've had this, you know, big debate about that here recently, um, or in terms of being able to lay people off anytime, whatever you want. Um, that's a very negative dynamic for family formation. And on the elite end too, it's, you know, you need to get on a plane and fly to China tomorrow. Um, you know, I think elite, obviously, actually, like, you know, the family strains are at both ends. Um, on the low end, uh, you know, it's it's people never getting married, um, a lot of out-of-wedlock births and, and broken families. 
on the high end, you have in the U.S. at least intact two parent families, but they don't have any children in part because of financial pressures and because they're working, you know, uh, 100 hours a week um, because they've spent their entire 20s and 30s in, in you know, a rather ridiculous education system and so on. Uh, so I think you, you could potentially ease pressures on, on both sides. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's funny, like even thinking about a little bit higher up on the income scale or education scale, um, running in parallel has been like this culture of entrepreneurship and tech startups uh, that is almost uh, uh, psyoping um, uh, people to sort of like basically work in this precarious environment, kind of like a uberfication of uh, office white collar work. Famously, you know, many of these startups fail. Um, a lot of like inside the industry, like the VC community, like knows a lot of like churn happens with these like founders or early staff that go with these tech startups. Uh, and so instead of like supplying them with some of these, um, uh, again, like for better or worse, like managerial jobs, we'll call them. Um, yeah, they, they get sent out into like kind of this fake uh, sector to like preoccupy their minds and like only a minority of them will actually make money of which that money is mostly going to go towards uh, the VCs and uh, their partners. So an interesting culture with entrepreneurship there. Um, yeah, to, to shift gears a little bit more, um, can you speak on what is some of the intellectual influences that we should have with economics um like currently like milton friedman is the avatar of sort of the old way um who are some economists thinkers that people should read uh to get acquainted with more of these realistic ideas uh whether they be you know uh, a contemporary today or someone from 20th century 19th century etc yeah um well, I think, you know, it's it's interesting because it, it has a sort of pretty highly respected intellectual lineage. And then you, you get up to, you know, post 1950s or whatever, and it, and it sort of stops. Um, it's not to say there aren't people thinking about it, but they just stop being seen as like mainstream um, reputable figures in the in economics department. Uh, they tend to be elsewhere, but yeah, I mean, you know, certainly, you know, you, you know the the American system canon. Um, I think most people would would start it with Hamilton, and and then you have uh, List and and Carey and uh, Henry Clay and and Lincoln and and uh, and all that. Uh, I think, I mean, you know, it's it's kind of interesting the extent to which the the sort of leading industrialists of kind of the the U.S. Gilded Age were, you know, by by today's standards, kind of uh, autarkic nationalist industrial policy guys. Um, and yeah, then you get to like, you know, the, the, the mid 20th century. Um, I think there's some really interesting, you know, thinkers out there. Um, they don't get a lot of credit in, in economics departments, but, um, you know, people like uh, Alfred Chandler, um, and uh, uh, Alberto Hirschman. Um, I'm trying to think of of some other ones uh, that that people should read, but um, there are there are quite a few uh, in terms of, of that kind of history, you know. But but once you get into more recent times. They, they tend to be, you know, who is the guy like Joe Studwell, How Asia Works uh, was his book, which, you know, is not read in any economics department, um, but it's it's much more of, of like an actual concrete history of, of how businesses actually operate and, and how that interacts with policy. Um, there's a guy at Harvard Business School. I mean, actually, the, the more interesting thinkers today tend to be at the business schools rather than the economics department, because the business schools actually have to grapple with real companies. Um, so at Harvard Business School, you have Willie Shi, uh, who does a lot of good work. Um, you mentioned people like uh, Mariana Mazzucato. Um, there's another one named uh, Robin Klingler Vidra, uh, who writes these really good histories of, of kind of efforts to, uh, I think her, what is her book called? Um, something like 
I don't, I don't know. It's about other countries' attempts to create. It's called the venture capital state or something like that. Um, it's about other countries' attempts to create sort of innovation clusters, a la Silicon Valley. Um, there's a fascinating Australian scholar named Linda Weiss uh, who wrote a book called America Inc. Um, and that is that is just the you know I think the best study I've read of kind of U.S. defense. Uh, defense apparatus efforts from kind of like the 1960s to the present to basically support certain strategic industries. Um, obviously, you know, we publish a lot of people at American Affairs, a um, uh, great, great scholar named David Adler, who also just comes from the finance industry. Um, you know, uh, people like Susan Helper, who's now in the Biden administration. Um, who's the other one? There's another... Uh, now, uh, uh, Heather Boucher is a bit, uh, there's another woman named Susan that just left. Anyway, oh, uh, Liz Reynolds is her name. Um, she just left. Uh, a guy, William Bobbillion, is at MIT. He used to be a kind of Senate staffer, um, writes a lot of good stuff. If I start going through the contemporary names, I'll forget someone and then they'll be slighted. But um, uh, it's obviously, it's coming back now, I think, you know, in the, in the in 1989, um, you know, there there were people out there like, uh, uh, you know, well, you had Lighthizer and you had um, who's Clyde Prestowitz, uh, but, you know, they were just so totally ignored um, that, you know, it, it's really unfortunate. So there's just this gap from like 1970 to 2000 or so where you, you don't get a lot of, of, of scholarship, at least not in economics departments, but um, then casting the net a bit wider, um, there's a sociologist named Leah Greenfeld, uh, who's done a lot of work on nationalism, but also written a book connecting kind of the economic side of it. Um, you've seen some new kind of histories, which are really interesting today. Um, Eric, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, I'm going to say Helliner, um, wrote a great one. Uh, there's one called uh, Forging Global Fordism. It's very good. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff, I don't I don't read Japanese, so I don't have a lot of access to a lot of the Japanese thinkers, but I'm sure there's some good stuff over there. And there's certainly some very good histories of Japan and Minty and all of that, as well as some of the, the China scholarship. Yeah, but yeah. Obviously, the easiest thing to do is just read American Affairs. <laughs> yes, yes, please, everyone. Uh... Read American Affairs. That's the best uh, source for contemporary scholarship on this. Um, but yeah, all those names you mentioned are are interesting and, and worthwhile looking up. Um, Eric Highliner has been on the show as well um, for his book, The Neo Mercantilist. And then he actually just came out with a book called The Contested World Economy that has even a bigger scope of looking at, uh, you know, kind of the three main traditions and then sort of adjacent ones. Um, uh, throughout sort of basically the modern era in total. Um, so that's a great place to start. Uh, and then, yeah, geographically getting outside of just like names. Uh, but you know, all of our allies to the 20th century, Japan, South Korea, Germany, if we actually look at them and instead of just applying this simplistic frame of, uh, like I see the meme all the time of North Korea versus South Korea with the lights on lights off. And that's always used to say basically like free, free market, extremism is is the uh uh is the solution there when uh you know no one really understands what was going on with south korea from like 1960 to 1980 and how that fundamentally uh had a very naturally oriented industrial strategy and um a plan behind it and how that basically set south korea up for massive growth and industrial strength in uh, global markets um so yeah so japan south korea germany all good things um, yeah, I think, uh, as we conclude, um, uh, I don't want you to do any fortune telling, but now that we are at about like a 3% inflation level and, um, we have the, uh, indicators that, you know, there's, there's activity occurring in the construction of manufacturing real estate and all that type of stuff. Uh, where do we go from here um, in terms of the economy and what we, should we be expecting for the rest of the 2020s or next or next two years, three years of the 2020s? 
Right. Um, well, first off, I mean, U.S. industrial policy still remains relatively narrow um, in terms of its sectoral focus. Uh, so I think the big question will be, you know, is that actually built out, um, particularly to encompass, you know, less concentrated uh, sectors or industries and, and, so, and really whole supply chains and sort of building these manufacturing and hard tech ecosystems in the way that, say, China did it? Right now, I don't think, you know, you're going to get there. Um, you've been able to basically write some big checks to Intel uh, and and do a couple of kind of fairly large battery things. But when it comes to actually extending out those supply chains and, and filling in those intermediary imports and really building up the kind of hubs of expertise around sectors that you need for this to work, I don't think we're quite there yet. So the question becomes, you know, does that happen? Uh, and there are certainly a number of legislative proposals that are out there and which I think have bipartisan support. And I think, you know, no matter who's president in 2024, those will likely be on the agenda. Uh, but but nothing there is certain. Um, so that's that's the, the big one. Um, you know, I think the. To me, the inflationary issue, I mean, it, we're we're very much in or, you know. Everyone forgets that, you know, there were there were two parts of the inflation story or, you know, solving the stagflation issue of the 70s. One was the Volcker shock. Of course, that's the one everybody remembers. But oddly, people actually forget the Reagan supply side reforms. Um, and at that time, those neoliberal supply side reforms did encourage investment, uh, at least for, for some years. And today, I think it's actually, you know, the real supply side policy and thus the anti-inflationary policy in the long term will come down to whether you're able to rebuild um, some of these uh, manufacturing sectors and supply chains and actually genuinely increase productivity and supply. And today those reforms do, you know, they're not going to be broad tax cuts. They're going to be much more targeted industrial policies. Um, you know, I, I hesitate to speculate too much on uh, the rest of the 2020s because that'll That'll depend on what a lot of a lot of people do. Um, but my my sense is that either either you you have kind of a bit more of a return to uh, nation state driven economies um, that can address the fundamental problems and imbalances that plague their own and the global economy, um, or if for whatever reason you just have this continued uh, drift or the reform, you know, the path we've started just doesn't quite make it the whole way, uh, then I, I suspect, you know, we'll be we'll be back into, you know, political chaos again fairly quickly. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, another, another good uh, book just to throw out there too, which I figured you might enjoy, uh, The History of Japanese Economic Development, uh, by Kenichi Ono. Uh, he's a professor over at Stanford, and he did a really good job of explaining um, uh, a lot of the trends going all the way back to like even um, the 16th century in Japan and really setting up the frame of uh, how they developed and uh, and talking a lot about sort of the national industrial strategy of the Meiji government that came in. Um, so So yeah, so thank you for coming on. Uh, once again, everyone check out American Affairs, buy a subscription, um, very good content. You'll see a lot of these types of perspectives on economics as well as other issues. Um, is there any uh, closing um, things you want to advertise? Uh, no, our next issue will come out on August 20th. Um, and um, yeah, other than that, I think that's that's it. Great. Oh, uh, I just said. You uh, you wrote a uh, a good article or section for the rebuilding capitalism kind of uh, handbook book uh, for American Compass. I encourage everyone to also go check out American Compass and read uh, that book. Um, it's a really good encapsulation of some of these ideas, um, and you can read uh, Julius's section. Uh, so yeah. So once again, thanks and uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you.